Uh, brothers and sisters, hello yet again. Uh, this is a, a wee catechesis on the Feast of the Holy Trinity, uh, which we keep this Sunday, the Solemnity uh, of the Most Holy Trinity. We have just passed through the whole cycle of Lent and Easter, ending on a high note with Pentecost last Sunday. Now it's green time, ordinary time again, and it will be, of course, till the end of the year, uh, until late November. But uh, as we know, ordinary time uh, has its own feasts too. And we're just coming up to this little clutch of uh, three feasts, the Trinity, Sunday, following Sunday, uh, Corpus Christi, and then the Friday after the uh, Sacred Heart. So all of them are solemnities and they all come together in less than two weeks. So it's quite something, three major feasts really. And I'm putting them together because they do, in a way, belong together. Now, liturgy has a history, it doesn't fall from heaven. It has, well, some of it does, <laughs> but it has built up over time. And uh, the Lent Easter cycle, that, that was the first to develop in the early Christian centuries. Then came Advent and Christmas. And Trinity, Corpus Christi and the Sacred Heart belong to a later stage, stages. Feast of the Trinity appears from the 9th century, Corpus Christi from the 13th, and the Sacred Heart from the 17th. But they belong together in, in another way, because they all presuppose what has gone before, what has been celebrated in the Christmas cycle, and especially the Easter cycle. They're all kind of pauses, looking back, and they each draw from what's happened one aspect, and ask us to focus on it. The Trinity, well, that's clear. Uh, the whole Christmas, Easter, Pentecost story have the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as their source and their content. They're the main actors. Then the Eucharist, because Christmas and Easter bring us Jesus, and Jesus is present among us in the sacrament of his body and blood. The Eucharist sums it all up and enables us to take and eat. And then the Sacred Heart, because the story is a love story, and Jesus' heart is the symbol and the wellspring of his love. Well, here's another comparison. You know, you go to a, a concert, uh, you, you have a you know, concerto or symphony or whatever, and at the end, sometimes the performers come back and give us an encore. And it's as if from Advent to Pentecost, we've been listening to a grand concerto. And then we're treated to these three encores, the conductor, the soloist, whoever, you know, comes back on stage and something is played, something else is played, but of the, of the same style. And we can applaud and appreciate again. These are feasts of appreciation. Another comparison that strikes me, um, you know, when I was a boy and you see grown up people doing it, the pleasure of skimming stones across water and seeing how many times they bounce. And if you throw well, you can get a good distance between each bounce on the water. And then usually the stone just does a few short ones and down it goes. Well, imagine each liturgical year, God the Father on the shore of eternity, he throws the smooth stone of his son into the water of the world. First bounce, Christmas, second bounce, Easter, well, it's a good throw, so 50 days more, third bounce, Pentecost, and then, yes, it slows down. Three short bounces in succession, Trinity, Corpus Christi, and Sacred Heart. Well, does the stone then sink without trace? Well, I hope not. That's up to us. I hope it sinks into our hearts and becomes the foundation stone <laughs> of a building, of the temple of God that we Ah, but that's another story. Okay, uh, so let's look at this feast. Uh, the entrance antiphon, I know we often, it, it gets cut out, but sometimes they're very interesting. Blessed 
be God the Father and the only begotten Son of God and also the Holy Spirit for he has shown us his love. What we are doing on Trinity Sunday is looking back, as I said, at the whole story from Advent on. We are, as it were, reviewing it, doing an audit almost. And as we do, we realize that the chief actor is the triune one in three God. The Father has sent the Son, Christmas, and then through the Son, dying and rising at Easter, the Holy Spirit, Pentecost. These events are the outward sign of God's inner life. As the theologians say, the missions in time, the sendings in time, reveal the processions of God's eternity, his inner life. So God has drawn close to us as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He has let us into his secret, his inner life. At the Last Supper, Jesus says, I call you friends, because I have made known to you everything I have heard, received from my Father. St. Thomas Aquinas comments, the true mark of friendship is that a friend reveals to his friend the inmost secrets of his heart. Yes, that's friendship. And this is what God has done. And St. Thomas goes on, since friends are one in heart and soul, when a friend reveals himself to his friend, he doesn't go outside himself. So we can say that when God makes us his friends, by disclosing himself, he is inviting us into himself, into his own house, as it were. The Second Vatican Council's constitution, Dei Verbum, on divine revelation, has a, has a go at summing things up. And it says, it has pleased God in his goodness and wisdom to reveal himself and to make known to us the hidden purpose of his will, by which through Christ, the word made flesh, man might have access to the Father in the Holy Spirit and come to share in the divine nature. Through this revelation, the unseen God, out of the abundance of his love, speaks to humans as his friends and lives among them so that he might invite and take them into fellowship with himself. Well, that's just another way of telling the same story. Uh, Saint Irenaeus, an early Christian writer, uses a metaphor, it's only a metaphor, uh, but it's a good one, I think, of the Son and the Spirit as the two hands of the Father. Through them, the Father has created the universe, the world, human beings, and through them, he has drawn it back to himself in the process of redemption. Everything flowing from him and back to him. And we are embraced. Well, for some 40 years now, a Franciscan priest, uh, Father Raniero Cantalamessa, has been preacher to the papal household. Uh, quite a challenge, preaching to the Pope. Uh, he has preached well, he must have preached hundreds of sermons and he's published many books. And one uh, we one is called Contemplating the Trinity. And what I really like is its subtitle, The Path to an Abundant Christian Life. Now, emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, this feast is all about abundance. The Trinity is God's abundance. And as we come to realize and relish the reality of it, so our life can abound. So the entrance antiphon blesses God. That's what you do when you've got an abundance. Blesses God the Father, the only begotten Son, and the Holy Spirit, for he has shown us his love. The Latin says, because he has done mercy with us. The great mercy of knowing and loving God as he really is, as he has shown himself. To be. Well, uh, in the Catechesis on Pentecost, I mentioned that in the Christian East, Pentecost, last Sunday, is the Feast of the Trinity for them. When the Holy Spirit comes, God's sharing of himself is complete. Uh, one of the Fathers says, I'm paraphrasing, but that's more or less it, God the Father has been revealed in the Old Testament, the Son of God in the New, and the Holy Spirit now 
in the church, that is, from Pentecost on. So now we stand back and see. We should be gasping, we should be saying, wow, uh, this is fullness. There's a lovely antiphon from the Eastern liturgy often quoted in this context. We have seen the true light, we have received the heavenly spirit, we have found the true faith, and we worship the indivisible Trinity, for the Trinity has saved us. It's the same idea, really, in our liturgy as well. So the readings give us a sense of God's goodness to us. In the first from Exodus, the Lord passes before Moses on the mountain and proclaims the Lord, the Lord, a God of tenderness and compassion, slow to anger, rich in kindness and faithfulness. In the second, St Paul ends his second letter to the Corinthians with a Trinitarian wish, prayer, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. It's that sense of embrace again. In the Gospel come Jesus' words, God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost but may have eternal life. Loved the world so much. So a sense is built up of us being gifted of something rich, full, lavish, meaty, juicy, if you like, and all-encompassing coming to us, God with us in every dimension, a Father who is above and around us, a Son who is beside us, a Spirit who is within us and between us, a God from whom is everything, through whom is everything, in whom is everything. It's good news. Now, atheism is, is fashionable in some circles, in our Anglo-Saxon world especially. And Richard Dawkins is well known with his books, The God Delusion and Now Outgrowing God. It was very prominent in Waterstones before lockdown. Uh, we could begin an interesting discussion here. But what I want to say is this. Well, we might say, uh, no, no, I'm not an atheist. I'm a theist. Fine. Or, to make it clearer, I'm a monotheist. Fine. But don't stop there. Because I think we often do. We stop there in our prayers even, maybe. Who do we pray to? God, perhaps? Well, great. Fantastic. Jesus? Fine. Great. But have we grasped that we're not any kind of monotheist? We are Trinitarian monotheists. Now, this feast emerged first in the 8th and 9th centuries, and the Christians of that time had, well, a very simple, rather bland, but I like it, touching phrase for their faith, the faith of the Holy Trinity, Fides Sancte Trinitatis. Saint Bede, the great Northumbrian monk and historian, used it often. And if, if this phrase evoked all sorts of things for them. It was in part a response to early Islam, actually, but it captured for them the richness of God's gift and of the faith by which we respond, open ourselves to it, the joy of believing the Trinity. In a God who is one and three, without these two realities cancelling each other, what is the Trinity? The Trinity is not an extra optional app in our Christian life. I, I believe in God, so I've downloaded the God program into the computer of, of me, and then up pops a little advert, get the Trinity app. I think, no, I won't, it's all too complicated. I've got God, uh, I've got Jesus. But the divine program is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The advert's a scam. So God is Trinity. The Trinity's not an add-on, nor for that matter, a theological Rubik cube. How can three be one? It's the path to an abundant Christian life, as Father Cantalamessa says, and here's a good quotation from him. Oh, how wonderful it is to have the Trinity as our God. When we discover the Trinity, we are no longer tempted to exchange Christian monotheism for any other monotheism. I would feel sorry for any God who had no one with whom to communicate and to share his joy with the profundity 
that is uniquely his. I think he would feel himself tremendously alone and unhappy. The proof of the Trinity's existence appears on the first page of the Bible. God created man in his own image, and precisely because we were to be in his image, he added, it is not good for man to be alone. Yeah, there's a thought. We are individuals because God is one. We are social. We need and want others in our lives because God is three. It's not that we have to explain the Trinity or do the Rubik Cube. It's the Trinity that explains us. The path to an abundant Christian life. And we can say the path to an abundant Christian prayer as well. Our Father, and we his children. St. Therese of Lisieux saying the Lord's Prayer sometimes just got stuck there, couldn't go on. She was so, so, uh, found it so wonderful that you've got a Father. We're no longer orphans. Jesus, I trust you. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me. Come, Lord Jesus, we pray to the Son. We pray through him, with him, in him, and to him. We have a brother, a companion. I will come to you, he says. Then come Holy Spirit, too. Veni Sancte Spiritus, Veni Creator Spiritus. He will be with you, he will be in you, says Jesus. We don't know how to pray, says St. Paul, as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with sighs too deep for words. So, you know, God prays in us. So Christian prayer has this Trinitarian abundance to it. Beautiful thing. The Father has unveiled his co-eternal Son and sent him among us. The Father and the Son then complete the gift and send us their spirit. That is, as it were, Advent to Pentecost. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Yes, the Trinity is the beginning and the end and the middle too, actually. But we begin Mass in the name of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and end with, may Almighty God bless you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Christian life begins being baptised in the name, into, says the Greek, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we are dying, please God, we may, the prayer will be said beside us, go forth, Christian soul, from this world, in the name of God, the Almighty Father who created you, in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, who suffered for you, in the name of the Holy Spirit, who has was poured out for you. So again, we are encompassed. On Trinity Sunday, we say yes to this abundance. We profess the faith of the Holy Trinity. Christian, Trinitarian, monotheism. We don't know how spoiled we are. We don't need to work it all out during the Mass. We're just meant to rejoice in it. Uh, Gaudium de Veritate, joy in the truth, says Saint Augustine. So now there's praise and worship music, isn't there? Um, now, some like it and uh, some, some don't, I couldn't possibly comment. But music aside, uh, Trinity Sunday is for praise and worship. This is our response to God, to, to God the Father sending us the word of truth and the spirit of holiness. Again, that the first word of that entrance antiphon is blessed or blessed. And then, you are blessed, Lord God of our fathers, says the responsorial psalm. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, says the Gospel acclamation. Both the Mass and the Divine Office for this day pile up words like acknowledge, confess, profess, bless, thank, adore, glorify, praise. This is the first fruit of Pentecost. Praise, great thing, takes us out of ourselves, comes from love and gratitude, it anticipates heaven. And the word praise links to our words prize and precious and appreciate. 
We praise what we prize and appreciate. We praise what is precious, the faith of the Holy Trinity. Trinity Sunday is a praise day of Trinity in unity and unity in Trinity, praised by angels and archangels, cherubim too and seraphim, says the preface, holy, holy, holy. Thank you.